Uh, two, one, go. Yeah, I thank you all for being here to join us tonight. We are going to uh, continue our study on uh, Revelation, the seven churches Revelation, and we're going to take a sort of a different look uh, than just the verse by verse we have been doing. But before we get into it, uh, let's begin with prayer. Dear kind and heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful um, love uh, beyond measure. Uh, your you reach out to us uh, spiritually and socially. Uh, uh, you, you, you look out for our finances. You look out for our health. And Father, we, in countless ways, you're always looking out for us. And Father, tonight we want to praise you for uh, Jerry coming back. Uh, we pray for him that you'll continue to watch and give him healing and, uh, and give, give joy, peace as well. Uh, Father, I don't know what other concerns we have, but I know each one of us has something going on. Uh, a lot has to do with family these days, and we pray, Lord, that you will bless our families and bless our time together uh, as we study your word. And Father, let your Holy Spirit lead to not only the words we say, but also in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, so Sally is in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting constant little notes from uh, Barbara, so that's the ding you're hearing. Maybe I should try to turn that off. Here's some Tammy. Tammy. Oh, well, good. There's Tammy coming in. Good. Hey, Hi, Tammy. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tammy and Sally, good to have you. Uh, we were, we were just beginning um, uh, looking at. <laughs> a little bit deeper view on the seven churches and not just going verse by verse that we usually do. Uh, it seemed like a, there is a, a great opportunity here for us to see some of the things some of the giants have seen through through the years and uh, that I thought it'd be good to take. But when you when you study the seven churches, you'll often come across something called the ages of the churches. Oh. And that many scholars see the seven churches, not just as a personal, you know, warnings to us, mm. personal uh, commentation, but also um, showing us what is going to happen with the church. And at the time of the writing, of course, John uh, was now writing about what was future to him about the future of the churches. And what people have seen is he can, they can look at the seven churches and see that it covers time periods for the church all the way to the end of Jesus. So how you, how you see a lot, I mean, I, I've looked at this from a lot of different uh, scholars and almost all of them break this down pretty much like this. The dates, you know, don't worry about the dates too much. They're all sort of general dates. That's usually where the difference is. You know, some are a little later, some are a little earlier, some are a little longer. But it's sort of a general sort of these sort of things. Actually, actually, there's actually some overlaps as well. So you'll see that, uh, uh, for instance, the Church of Ephesus, right? It's as seen as the early church, and that it did lots of lot of good things. You know, it, 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 it sought it sought what was right, but in the end, it was it was losing its love for Jesus and the message. Uh, the Smyrna Church. Under, underwent great persecution, and we see that coming after the early church in the time of 100 to 323 AD. And I think when uh, Larry went over this, he talked about the persecution at the time that it was a persecuted church, you know, in the beginning, but it also how it represented that 10 year period when there was massive uh, persecution before. Rome took over as being, uh, before Christianity became the official church of Rome. And that's one of the hints that, oh, look at this, it, it fits right in there. And then you have Pegamus, or uh, Pergamus rather, I don't know what I think, Pergamus, that represented a time when Christianity was being uh, paganized, if you will. It's the Rome was trying to inter, uh, trying to intermix both of them so they could have happy happy citizens who could do their former pagan rituals and somehow call them Christian rituals. And you see that there's sort of about an intermix going on. Uh, and then Thyatira uh, is that aged 
that's so well represented uh, in Daniel. You, we see him talking about it a lot in Daniel 7, you know, with the, uh, and uh, the, the little horn power coming up, the age of papal uh, supremacy and the time period there. And that's where we get the time period here. It turns out that it, it looks a lot like that. Uh, Sardis uh, was the time of the Counter-Reformation. And for those who don't know that, uh, you know, the papacy wasn't unaware that people were using the book of Daniel and prophecy to point out their, <laughs> their place in scripture, and it wasn't a good place. And so they, they went through a whole series of things to try to turn that around. And that was a counter-reformation. So, uh, and that's why it says, you know, they, they looked alive, but actually they were dead. Uh, Philadelphia, this is the great awakening period. And in that period, uh, people started to turn back to the Bible and get a zeal for missionary work again. And it was a great period of, of pushing out, uh, understanding the book of Daniel was opened up and shown to the world that it was talking about that Jesus was coming again. It was a great time. And then the Laodicean church is that time when the church gets real comfortable <laughs> and thinks it knows, thinks it has everything, but it's only missing one thing, you know, Jesus. And so they're lukewarm. They're neither hot for the Lord or cold, you know, where they can be turned on. They, they are lukewarm. So this is sort of the the general framework uh, of that a lot of scholars, a lot of ev evangelists, a lot of really good Bible students see how the seven churches that Christ, as it says in verse one of Revelation chapter one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which gave him, which he gave to the servants to show them things which must shortly take place. And to drill down in that a little bit, uh, we can look at the church at Ephesus. And uh, it started off really good. It was, it was a hot church. You know, we see that, uh, that the early Christians, they were called Christians. Why? Well, they always talked about Christ. <laughs> Everywhere they went, they were talking about Christ. And uh, so there was a lot of zeal going on. And uh, also in the Acts 2 church, I mean, they ate with each other. They, they prayed together, they had everything in one, you know, one accord, and the church was booming. Uh, but then there's this warning of false teachers, and it seems like there's this, there was a lot of falseness going on, the Nic Nicolaitans, <laughs> as opposed to the Nickelodeons. The Nicolaitans, uh, you know, were, were teaching false doctrine, and it seemed like there was a big focus on trying to keep that down, and was, what was wrong with focusing on false doctrines? Well, first of all, it comes with the word false. <laughs> so, so you, you know, you want to uh, always stay close to truth and far away from false. But also the false that was starting to creep into the church, false doctrines, has a way of uh, dividing the church. Well, in fact, and that's, that's the bad part, isn't it? It's the division it cause, causes, um, and I'm I am just you know I think in in the United States right now we see the problem with uh, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong it's the fact that something just caused division you know and uh, that's more destructive than the than than the false doctrine in some way uh, not saying that false doctrine is good but what can happen is you can lose your mission. Instead of being a mission of spreading Christ, they were on a mission to eke out falseness. And that has, that has, its, uh, has a way of turning you cold to other people. Um, hey, on the, there's a little bit of danger in working towards unity. Yes. Uh, which, which is a big thing right now with the, the Catholic Church. They're trying to bring home the, um, I forget what they, <laughs> they call us, have a name for us. Oh, the departed brethren. Um, they're trying to unite us. And they think the, the big division was over the righteousness by faith theme alone. 
So they come out with a statement that says that they believe that and they think now that's going to unify us. Uh, I don't think that God is necessarily looking for us to be uh, just spot on agreeing on every uh, doctrine. I think when his prayer of unity that he prayed, I think is in John 17, the unity was that we would be in him and him and us just as the father and him are in each other. And your verse right there, 1 Corinthians 13, pretty much says it all, that love trumps everything. So when we seek to be unified, it needs to be in, in Christ, more about being in Christ. And I, I don't want this to sound wrong, but less about doctrine, because there are some doctrines that we squibble over that really, in the long run, probably don't have a hill of beans uh, as as it relates to ultimate salvation and the mission of carrying the gospel to the world. Hope that makes sense. Well, I, you know, I, I would say that Jesus, uh, he, he commended Ephesus that they, uh, they couldn't bear evil and they tested the apostles and he, he found out which women were liars. That was, that was fine. He loved the perseverance and patience. But the trouble was is that along the way, they lost their love for one another. And that's more dangerous, <laughs> right, is what he's telling them. But so it says, yeah, don't stop seeking truth. That's good. But right. if we seek truth and we are no longer loving, then we've taken the wrong road. Truth will set you free. <laughs> and Jesus Christ will set you free indeed, right? And that is the message of the, that we need to, need to hold on to, is that we need not to lose our love as we seek truth. Right. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that seems to be the message which, you know, the, the thing which we hold on to and the early church uh, thing that happened. And he, you know, God said, yeah, I know this is going to happen, so I'm going to, you know, tell you up front, this is what's going to happen, and here's the solution, right? The solution is to... Yeah, actually return, return, and remember, right? Uh, so that he he says that uh, remember where you have fallen, you know, repent and do your first works. Right? There is a high calling in being a Christian, you know, and I, and it means that we represent Christ. Christ did seek out truth and did tell truth, but he also sought out people and brought them in. You know, um, my brother tells me of a church he, used, he went to when he lived in Montana, and the people in that church didn't want to bring in anyone else in the church because the church was perfect as it was. All right. Well, that church was dead <laughs> because if you're not if you're not reaching out to the world, then you're then you're missing uh, the point. Which brings us more to, like a club than a church. Yeah, yeah, it was a club. Yeah, exactly. So then we turned to the, the church at Smyrna. And uh, do you remember what Smyrna was, <coughs> was uh, what was going on there? A lot of persecution. Absolutely. Uh, it says, and, and Jesus represented himself as the first and the last. He was dead and came to life, and for those who were about to lose their life in martyrdom, that was a that was a that was a reassurance. Uh, and there was a message about not fearing the tribulation, what was coming to them, because they would end up with a crown of life. Um, so uh, there was a ten-year period from 303 to 313 A.D., which Larry actually pointed out, I think, in which the the, the emperors were trying to change and uh, trying to get rid of Christianity you know, a lot because, hey, they wouldn't wish, worship uh, the emperor. They wouldn't, they wouldn't say a little prayer in front of him and throw the little incense in at the right time. Yeah. And they looked like they were not loyal citizens. So that, uh, that persecution did happen at a later time, again, prophetic. Uh, to, to them, to us looking back and we're reassured that God knows who he's talking about. Um, the last 
Uh, you see, you see the list of martyrs here, from Justin Martyr, Polycarp, all the way down to Victor Victor Nunes. <laughs> and all, all, oh, very good, thank you. And uh, they were tested for those ten years for sure. Uh, and Christians in this church, uh, it says they weren't afraid, and you know, they weren't afraid to suffer. And their suffering, God said, made them wealthy in spiritual fruit, where we might not be as wealthy. So that was Smyrna. Any questions on that? Okay. Pergamus. Um, Pergamus represents the time of the church when there was a mixing of paganism and Christianity. Constantine had decided that he was going to make Christianity the official Roman religion. And in doing so, because now it's the, it's the religion of the state, all sorts of bad things start to happen, right? So it says that Pergamus here comes from two Greek words, uh, tower and marriage, and signifies upward mobility through marriage. And the idea that Christianity and paganism would actually join them together and would make them more dominant in, in the Roman society. Uh, so what persecution in Smyrna might have failed to do, you know, maybe popularity would. So by about 300 AD, uh, nearly half of the Roman Empire thought of themselves as Christians. Uh, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? When you think about it, in 300 years, <laughs> what happened uh, in the growth of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, but pagan practices around the empire were sort of entering into Christianity. Uh, in fact, this first edict here uh Christ, you know the Constantine knew that a lot of the people were sun worshipers in in Rome and so he said well we'll just make sure people know that the venerable day of the sun let the magistrate and the people residing in the cities rest and let all the workshops be closed so he just decided the venerable day of the sun he was going to make that something part of the Roman Christian experience uh, Easter, by the way, that was interesting too. It, we know that the time we consider to be Easter is really based on the Passover. Mm. But the Passover is slightly different when you see your calendars. It happens at a slightly different time than when Easter happens. And in fact, sometimes it can be a month separated or so. And you think to yourself, why did that happen? Well, because there was a celebration in Rome that happened about on this Easter thing, which was more of a, um, oh, oh goodness, I hate it when I want to slip my memory, but it had to do with eggs and, <laughs> and bunny rabbits and how they could proliferate. Uh, and here we have this, uh, the Roman church deciding that that should be the day, that that should be the holiday that we observe for the resurrection of Christ. So Wasn't that a pagan holiday of fertility? Yeah, that's what the word I was, yeah. was fertility I was missing, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it, it was close enough, right? So they sort of, the Rome said, we want that. And, and the Jerusalem church said, no, we want Passover. But the power slipped over to the Roman church, right? So it, why do you suppose they, why do you suppose they emphasized uh, during this period, they emphasized these pagan holidays uh, and tried to adopt some of those into the Christian. Well, I mean, it, it could have been for all the for good, good reasons. I mean, they wanted to make Christianity easier for the pagans to adopt. Ah. So, I, so if you if you always followed this as a as a day to worship, then hey, we'll pick that day. Or if you always brought this as a celebration, well, we'll. It's only a few days of difference, right? We can move that one over to this one, and so it's pretty easy. Yeah, but unfortunately, it also, it also carried along a lot of things that had nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ and everything right. to do with fertility uh, in there. Eggs and bunny uh, rabbits. Yeah, and yeah, eggs and yeah, bunny rabbits. Yeah, yeah why, do, why do I color Easter eggs? Um, yeah. Um, 
it's, and then as we, we talked about earlier that, uh, that in Ephesus, um, uh, in the Council of Ephesus, they decided to make uh, Diana, who was the mother of the gods, they decided to make Mary the mother of the gods, right? So we see all these things. And there, and there's a lot of different things that, that slip in there. Uh, yeah, but, totally. Yes. Uh, you know, the it was almost like the pagans had their holiday. Christians had theirs. Right. <clears throat> so with the Christians relenting and giving in, <clears throat> then it, it gets what we have today. If you think about it, Easter has Christians who still celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Yeah, praise then, the Lord. Then, and then the others who celebrate bunny rabbits. Right. And at Christmas time, you have people celebrating the birth of Christ and others celebrating the all-knowing Santa Claus. So those are two, two holidays in particular. There are others where um, it seems there's two different views on what we should be doing during right. those. Now, to be honest with you, we don't know, and, and a lot of people make this a big deal. We don't know when Jesus was born, that's true. But there's nothing wrong with celebrating his birth, no matter if you make it January the 6th, my birthday, doesn't matter. Uh, it's, the, it's the celebration of the, of the coming of Christ as a babe in a manger to die for our sins it's the most important thing that's why i say sometimes doctrines we kind of strain at a gnat and swallow a camel you know it it, it really um and i don't necessarily see anything wrong with uh, some of the pagan type things that that go on but you know in the long run as christians we should keep our priorities straight about what we're celebrating right well, but this is, it's, I mean, there's more to it. This is, you know, there's ended up being things like, um, you know, we could talk about, do you go to Jesus to get your sins forgiven? Do you end up going to somebody else? Well, you know, there's, there are lots of reasons why the somebody else was brought in, but it wasn't scriptural. So mm -hmm. we start to see sort of the pull between tradition and scripture. That's, that starts to happen here as well. So, um, and we'll see a little bit more of that, I think, uh, as we move on. But uh, uh, the the you know, when it talks about Balaam in this in this church, uh, Balaam, you know, brought this told Balak that the way to get Israel to sin against God, if you were, was was through immorality and idolatry. And so that's exactly what they they tried to do by sending the daughters of Moab in to seduce seduce them um, and this is sort of the mix the mix of Christ, does the Christians does we adopt enough paganism that we you know it becomes trouble well in fact he does you know Jesus is saying yet yeah, there's a problem here because he wouldn't have said repent or else I will come quickly to fight against them with the sword of my mouth what's the sword of his mouth yeah the word of God, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so basically he's given a little warning that the, you know, if you go in tradition versus the word, the word should win, not the other way around, just because of, you know, tradition might be more convenient to you. Okay. Yeah. In Hebrews uh, 4, it says this, uh, it says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, piercing, even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in Revelation 1.16, it says that his mouth went a two-edged sword and his cotton is like I said. So it's talking about the mouth of, of the vision of Jesus he was having. So, you know, Jesus's words are mighty for us, but they do divide. They divide false from truthness, right? right. Amen. So now we're into Thyatira, Thyatira. And this is almost universally seen by most of the people I read was as the age of papal supremacy. Uh, this actually goes right into Daniel 7, 25, where it says, you know, how long will the Lord out power give, be given power over the saints? And for a time, a time and half a time, which ends up being, being 
you know, three and a half months, day for the year, you end up with 120, uh, 1,260 years from the 538 when papal supremacy was it's, it's you know, in, in place to 798 when the Pope was taken captive. So this is the dark age of the church. And it's also the middle age, middle ages, if you will. Uh, and the fallen church is what is represented here. Um, you know, it's the, right, the woman Jezebel, he talks about that. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce, seduce my, my servants and to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not. So what is, you know what a woman is in scripture as far as a, a symbol, right? This is something you probably all know. Fallen in church. Well, a woman is a, a church. A woman is a church, yeah. A Jezebel is yeah, a fallen really church. Yeah. If you, if you, if you re remember, Jezebel was the one who got her, got Ahab, her husband, to, to bring in Baal worship into Israel. And, you know, it was Elijah who had to go and, you know, actually, he actually, uh, what, he put uh, a drought upon Israel through prayer. And then, you know, uh, had, had the showdown where he had the prophets of Baal try to light a fire <laughs> yeah. and get it going through their prayer when he had his drowned and then God just did it. So he said, and basically he said, yeah, how long we waver between two opinions? You know, mm -hmm. if God is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. And, you know, the, we have that same choice here, right? It's like, uh, are we going to, are we going to serve God or serve, uh, uh, the fallen church. I mean, the sexual immorality, do you know what that means when he says it causes you to commit sexual immorality in this case? Uh, that has a spiritual application. Ab absolutely. I mean, it's basically, it's basically, yeah, an immoral woman is chasing after other gods, you know, in the Old Testament. You see this all the time, chasing after other gods. So, yeah, so he's basically saying that Jezebel is teaching us to seek other gods. And even and unfaithful, though we, unfaithful, yeah. unfaithful. Um, and in she was given uh, the other time. It's interesting that uh, God says that there were those people who did not follow her, though. Right? It says God says that they did not follow this doctrine, and for them, he says I will put no other burden on you. You know, this just. Get, overcoming that was enough. That was like the Walden, Walden Seas the, uh, and others who fled to the mountains and uh, so they could follow the Lord and what he had to say. You know. Any questions on Thyatira? No, but I do want to point out that a lot, the drought was for three and a half years. Yes, it was. And that's another symbol of the 1260 year drought of God's word. I mean, the word was rare back in those days it was you know it, martin luther king found the uh, bible he was a priest and uh, the bible he found was written in latin and was chained to a I think you mean martin world. luther i think you mean martin, martin luther. luther what did i say <laughs> martin luther king oh i did for a second i had a dream and i, I had a dream yeah. maybe i ought to go back to sleep <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i do that every now and then <laughs> Right. No, yeah, you're right. It, it, it is very interesting that the drought was three and a half years. I mean, it yeah. is a, does a, a really good parallel there for us. And then Sardis, I'm got to speak up a little bit, but Sardis, you remember they said he they were alive, they looked alive, but they were really dead. And this goes into what was called the Counter Reformation because those reformers who didn't accept and like Martin Luther, you know, were doing a great job telling people. You know, the papacy is doing a lot of the Antichrist things, right? He's, he's putting himself as God, pretending to be God when it really isn't God. And in, in teaching 
this through Daniel and Revelation, it was really putting a hurt <laughs> on the papacy. So Pope Paul III said, well, we need to come up with some uh, other arguments. And, uh, and so in the Council of Trent, the first thing they wanted to do was say, well, is, do we go by scripture alone or do we go by scripture and tradition? And the result of that was the Catholic Church chose the latter, scripture and tradition. And you know, I, I don't, I don't mind tradition, but I don't, I don't like tradition that counteracts scripture. At that point, I have trouble with it. Uh, and they also were were sent off to come up with alternate interpretations of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. As you know, we've been presenting to you the historical point of view. Well, they came up with a preterist, which interpreted all the prophecy of having already been fulfilled. So that was before them. So it couldn't be, they couldn't be the Antichrist. And then are the futurist in which everything from the fourth chapter of Revelation on is actually out to the future, right? And will happen after the church is raptured. Again, that, that makes the, the, the papacy not the Antichrist. And that was the goal of these two, uh, these two alternate interpretations. The former, uh, the preterist view has probably doesn't have very many people following it, whereas the futurist view has been adopted by a lot of different people. Uh, and I think for uh, it has not done us done us a good service because we miss on the rich richness of prophecy that you can see in the historical view if you take that one. And also, you're sort of confused about some things about when Jesus will come back. <laughs> and so I. I think this is interesting because he says in chapter three, verse three, if you do not return to the word of life, you will not know the hour I will come upon you. So not turning to the word means that you will be sort of taken as a thief and that you will not know about Jesus' return, right? Jesus, uh, Eddie, any comment on that? Larry? Okay. Shirley? <laughs> No, just catch up. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Shirley. We appreciate you having here. Yeah, well, one thing that you know, that I've recognized looking at the preterist view and the uh, futurist view, uh, if you study like we are Revelation carefully, you'll see how those two are exactly what you said, and uh, and which is how do we get the antichrist to be somewhere else some somebody else instead of us although there are at least 10 identifying marks as what as the papal church uh that they qualify under those 10 you know whenever somebody talks to me about the antichrist i always say well let's go over the 10 marks or the beast of revelation 13. you know for somebody or something to be th those things, they have to qualify under those at least 10 identifying marks. For example, the beast of Revelation 13, you know, the 666, they make a big deal about that. But that's, that's just one out of 10 uh, marks of what, who the beast is in Revelation 13. Yeah. So um, I guess so uh, it, it's much, much more reasonable to have a historicist view of Revelation. I'm well, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a little ahead. confused. Okay. So the, the Catholic Church and its teachings is, sim, is, you're seeing those signs in that? Is that what you're saying? Well, well, I'm, well what I'm saying here is that the... The reformers, the great reformers, and Martin Luther being one of them, right. was able to demonstrate through the word that the what the papal church, what the papacy was up to at the time was easily identifiable as the Antichrist. And that they were using Daniel and Revelation to do that. And it was really using the historical point of view. Uh, so that's why Pope Paul III said, listen, guys, we need to come up with a, 
an alternative point of view so that they're not always pointing to us. And that's where these two, the preterist and the futurist point of view came from. Uh, this, the, this uh, actually these were Jesuit, Jesuits who, uh, you know, Rabiria and uh, Al Alcazar <laughs> uh, were Jesuits who were tasked with coming up with alternative views of uh, scripture and the prophecies. And they did that with the, under the direction of Pope Paul III to hmm. come up with a way for the, for the Reformation word to not be successful again. That's why it's under the Counter-Reformation. That's why the Counter-Reformation happened from the papacy, because they were well, not act so well. That's kind of <laughs> stuck for almost 500 years, their, their work back then. Right. Does that make sense? And we're, 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 we're likely to get more heavier into this in Revelation 13. And, OK. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'm, making hoping, sense. I'm hoping Eddie has Revelation 13, but we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for answering that. You know, actually, I do, Charlie. I was looking at uh, our schedule, and I do land on uh, Revelation 13. He you wins. Sure you don't want to take it? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to help you out as much as I can. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, actually, Revelation 13 is, in, in, in this case, in, in Revelation, it turns out to be the central part of the book of Revelation, and I'm going to show you why in a second. Uh, but let's first make sure to get, to get to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is, is looked at as the Great Awakening period. After the Counter-Revelation, the word started to go to everywhere. Uh, there, was British, there were Bible societies, like the British Bible Society and the American Bible Society. Missionary work was was uh, going full force. We were sending missionaries everywhere. Uh, and they took the gospel around the world. And they also opened up the books of like, book like Daniel <laughs> for everyone to understand. And so the door, you know, it says the, you know, the door opened in heaven, like it says in Hebrews 8, 1, 2, uh, that we have a high priest and uh, we can get there. And he was showing, people were being shown the true tabernacle uh, that, that uh, we have access to because of Jesus. And as Jesus, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. I know your works and I see what set be, I've set before you an open door that no one can shut. Praise God for that. The open door that we have is because of Jesus' sacrifice for us and because he is working for us every day. <laughs> you know, he's not on vacation. He's working for us every day uh, in the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, for us, and so this is this is all about that open door. Anyway, the message really went around the world. It's a great awakening. And you can read about it uh, in so many places where you'll see that it really the world got turned on to Christianity and turned on to Jesus, and that's why it's called the Faithful Church. It's um, interesting. And, and there, again, just like Smyrna, there was no condemnation of this church. Uh, everything you know, he was. It was a. Uh, he was very supportive of this church, and he says, Behold, I come quickly, and I have, uh, hold fast, hold fast to the truth, so no one take away your crown. And uh, to be a pillar Larry, in the church. Larry was, really great. Charlie. Yes, sir. Larry, Larry was about to say something there. Larry. I was, yeah. gonna, I was just going to say that if you look at the history of the Great Awakening in America, uh, that was a time when the Northwest Territory was still the Northwest Territory, which was the Western border of Ohio. That was Northwest Territory. That was our country at the time. And a lot of the American part of the Great Awakening took place in Washington County, Pennsylvania, which is just south of Pittsburgh. So if you look at the, if you research the, the Great Awakening in the American era of this time, You'll, you'll notice a lot of it took place there, which is really interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, another interesting thing is during this great revival, there was also false revivals going on too. Ah. Uh, that's one thing that uh, folks don't understand that. And that's what kind of the way Satan works. You know, when, the, when God gets to working one way, then Satan comes up with some sort of counterfeit. Yeah, true. Uh, 
Yeah, well, you have, in fact, that, that sort of indicated what he says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I'll make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So yes, Jesus was actually saying that this great revival is going to go on, but there's going to be people who pretend <laughs> to have, have the gospel but do not. do not. In fact, they are of, of Satan. So, uh, and behold, I'm coming quickly. Okay, so yeah, a tremendous period for for the world and, and America was amazing. You could have, you know, you could come in and say you're doing evangelistic series in almost any town in America, and you'd have the whole place filled. People would just come. It was pretty good, pretty great, pretty easy. But then the Laodicean period is the period after that, which is. This is the seventh one, which is until that Jesus comes. So about 1900 till, you know, through the return of Jesus Christ. And in this, we see several things. Uh, people are very satisfied. You know, they, uh, they're cold. And to the word, they were once hot, maybe, but uh, they have since become lukewarm. They have material possessions. I like Daniel sort of hinted at this when he said, knowledge shall be increased. Just think of the and go to and fro and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But what they don't have is the knowledge of God. Yes? Yeah. Someone had a question? I, I was, I had done a previous revelation study and some of the thoughts to that too were you'll be blind, blind to their own condition. Right. They mm. think of themselves opposite of what they actually are. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you remember, that's the, uh, the he says that you're, uh, you think you're, you think you're one thing, but really you're another, right? You, mm -hmm. you think you're rich. Think you're rich and creased with goods. <laughs> yeah, but you're, but you're poor, blind, and naked. And he says, you need to buy some ISAB for me mm -hmm. so you can see your true condition. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So in the last days, it's almost like the old, uh, they're going to go through the motions. They're going to be lovers of pleasure, as it says in Second Timothy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, is, that the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despires of despi despires of good, traitors, headlong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the form of godliness, but denying his power. And they also do rap music too, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like now. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, it should. Doesn't yeah. it? It should. I, do have, yeah. I do have a question about this though. This, this describes the Western church to a T today, but how do you reconcile this with the church of the East? I realize that the church really, everything that we study has always looked west but if we look to the east to the the church in china the church in iran the church in north korea none of this fits or most of this doesn't fit them and there are growing churches in those countries well you know this is this goes back to that this is uh this is not scientifically precise you know, it sort of tells you something about the ages of the church. Yeah. And sometimes I think you'll see that different parts of the world sometimes be in different parts of the ages of the church. Yeah. You so, know, Charlie. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead, Eddie. Uh, well, Larry, did you want to say something? I was. Gonna... No, no. I, I, I like Charlie's comment that, you know, you can kind of view different parts of the world in different ages of the church. Right. Where they're where they've mature where their maturity is or maturity uh, is probably not the right word. And there is a generality about a lot of this, uh, because uh even the, the Laodicean church uh may it and and although it represents a particular time, in this case it's the end time, but the second Timothy is not necessarily talking about the church, it's talking about the condition of uh of mankind of the world yeah of the world but um you know you mentioned the the, ch the church in the east well you know they're just like um 
these churches we've talked about, there's some good and there's some bad. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and I know they have a fervor for the Lord and, and they're growing. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that's the spirit of God working there. But at the same time, there may be some what we call shysters <laughs> among yeah. them. And, uh, but I know that as, as a lot of stuff in, in the Bible sound, can sound real succinct, but a lot of times it's, it's in the, the context of other passages and uh, tends to sometimes be a general thing that's happening at the end time rather than a, a just cut and dry. But you're right, it does fit us here in the West. Oh, yes. Very imperfectly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It really does. So we see these seven churches. And is there another way of looking at what's going on? You, we sort of summarize them in the ages. But what's interesting about the churches is that there's a relationship between the seven churches. Uh, for instance, uh, we have this loveless church of Ephesus. And what do they do? Well, they, they lost their first love. And what were they told to do? Repent and do your first works. And at the end time, we have the last church, which is the lukewarm church. Uh, their focus is on themselves, thus certainly not love of Jesus. And they're told to be zealous and repent. Uh, and you have the persecuted church in Smyrna who went through all this tribulation, but told, even though you're poor, you're rich because they're rich with all the spiritual success and they're told not to fear because god's going to be there god knows and god's already faced death and is alive again and then on the other side we have this faithful church called philadelphia which is being commended because it kept jesus's commandments and sort of like do not fear says i'll keep you from your hour of trial so jesus is uh, these both churches neither one of these were condemned in any way whatsoever both of them were commended for doing the things they should be doing, and both are giving assurance that Jesus is with them. Uh, and then you have the compromising church of, uh, of and we have the, the church that's alive and dead. So you have Pergamus and Sardis, one holding to the doctrine of Balaam, which we know is, is, is actually a, one of seducing you to other gospel and then you have one that uh, looks alive but is dead and this the first one the pergamus is told to repent or i will come quickly with the sword of my mouth right uh, and the the dead the sardis is told to hold fast and repent or i will come as a thief so they'll be surprised by what's going on because they don't know the word and then we have the seventh church up here the corrupt church of thyatira which jezebel seduces the servants and it says, I'm going to kill those children, which would be people who follow that, that line are not, are not in good favor with God. But those who have not gone to the depths of Satan, they're going to, they're not, they are being commended and they're going to put other, no other burden on them if they don't follow this deception of Jezebel. Now, do you see the connection here? You know, you see, oh, the compromising church is a lot like the dead church in Sardis. And you have the persecuted church has a, uh, as Smyrna is given all this good stuff is not, it's not a, uh, only has good things said about it and said, uh, yeah, I'm with you, don't fear. And the same with the faithful church in Philadelphia, you know, I'm going to be with you. And then we have the loveless church that is told to repent and do what they did at first. And you have the lukewarm church, which again, does it be zealous, do what you did at first and repent. So there seems to be some parallelism going on here. So this is, this is a chiastic model. The seven churches are written in a chiastic model and it's written that way for a purpose. Not only, I mean, the, the Bible is often written with parallelism. So we'll say one thing and then say the same thing again in reverse order sometimes. And that happens in chiastic models. In fact, you can see he's going up. He's actually coming back down saying the same thing and the the, the head of the pyramid, the top of the pyramid, is really the central point. I know you thought the central point was Laodicea, <laughs> but the central point of the seven churches is really Thyatira, which isn't too surprising when you think of Daniel 7, 
and how much time they spent on the little horn power. And then when we get to Revelation 13, how much that's the focus. So it's interesting that when you read this, God made the, 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 the format of, of the seven churches really puts a lot of emphasis on the church that was seduced by Jezebel. All right. mm -hmm. and, well, Charlie, let me, can I ask a question? Please do. Uh, Laodicea, their counsel to um, uh, buy ISAV, gold, yeah. and white raiment. Now we know those are all spiritual applications. They're not literal. <clears throat> do you think that members of the Laodicea can get out of their lukewarm warmness, number one. And number two, do you think that there are people in Laodicea who have perhaps bought the gold, the ISAV, and the white raiment? Uh, well, absolutely. Um, you know, absolutely. There, God actually told them, might, made a promise to them, that if they did those things, you know, right, if we go back to... Uh, Maybe we should go back to Lady City. Oh, goodness. Oh, I'm, I've, I've set this up so I can't go back to Lady City. Oh. Well, I guess my point okay. is yeah, that but, but even but though Lady City, you're right. I mean, God would not, God would not have told them about this problem unless there was a way to correct it. And then he gives them the solution. There you right. go. Yeah. Right. So that's good. Yeah. So, so basically, in, in verse 19 of Revelation 3, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, right? So, you know, his his rebuke is not to kill you, it's to fix, to help fix you, right? He's a good father. Right? He's the good shepherd. Right. He wants us to be saved. And then he goes on to say, um, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. This is, this to me, this is what sort of tells you something in particular about Laodicea, was Jesus was standing outside the door, just like in Ephesus where he was standing outside. He wasn't their first love anymore. Um, but he did say, open the door and I'll come in. You know, repent and be zealous again. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely, we can, and I think I think we're going to find that. I think when people people get turned on again to the study of the Word, and actually we have to we have to crucify self, right? Because we, being selfish people, we like comfort. We like cool things. <laughs> you know, that's that's the human part of us. The spiritual part. Boy, we need that connection with God, and so we have to mm -hmm. be crucified to self to to get rid of all that need for comfort, so that we can have our spiritual eyes open to see God and set the spiritual ears open to hear Him. And when we see Him, that revelation is what leads us to repentance. I like this model because it's a way to remember the different ages of the church from the historic, the historic view, which is, this is very handy to me. I, I like this approach. And it, it's also tells us that, you know, uh, that those who, who stay with them, <laughs> right? That's our, that's our main burden is to stay with Christ. There's so much deception around us. Yeah. and i had written a note about the isav to anoint your eyes so that you may see to discern your spiritual condition right amen there's two things we must we must have the isav for i think one is yeah to see what we, we really are when we're, we think we're rich <laughs> and we're really poor uh but the other side is to have a vision of god and to see who he is and mm -hmm. as we understand who he is, uh, all the things of this earth that are so attractive fall away. You know, he, and also talking about humility, right? <laughs> when we see who he is, all those things which we boast about fall away. 
But then our value comes because he loves us. And he loves us bigger than the universe, uh, each one of us. So if you ever think you don't have value, remember God loves you more than he loves the whole universe around him. He was willing to come here and give up everything for him. So we have our value in that, not in the things we do or the things we have or the people we influence uh, or the number of people on our podcast. So. <laughs> So there's another chiastic model too, and that's in the whole book of Revelation. It actually follows a chiastic model, and uh, Eddie introduced, I think, with, in chapter one of that happening, but there's a, a prologue, an epilogue, the seven churches, and that's its counterpart. This, see, these, these uh, chiastic models are really sort of a form of parallelism with a peak at the end, and sometimes the peaks by itself, you know, that's the point of the whole thing. That's the main point is where the peak is. Uh, so the seven churches say a lot of the same things that this, that God says about the new Jerusalem. And we'll look at that. The seven seals and the millennium, seven trumpets, the seven bowls, and then the final crisis, which, uh, has a lot of this stuff we're talking about. Why Thyatira is so important. We'll see it again in the, in, in the middle of, of revelation. So, so we said that the seven churches sort of go to the New Jerusalem. I'm going to make this quick because I realize once again, I've talked a lot, but yeah, you might want to take, do this study. I think I left this in your study notes. The ones that I, I think I sent the final study notes, Eddie, I'm not sure that I, the, the one I sent out was the final one. But uh, anyway, the, you have the promise of God in the seven churches and you see it, you see the similar wording in the, uh, the New Jerusalem. I see that sort of cutting off at the top, but you know, I will grant you to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. In Revelation 22, we see that the river went through and the, and the tree of life was uh, on both sides. And we talked about this in a previous session about the, right. the 12 months of fruits. <laughs> right. You will not be hurt by the second death, Revelation 2 to 11. Only the wicked are hurt by the second death in, in the new heaven, in New Jerusalem, 21 through 8, 21 verse 8. I will give him a new name. And in the, in the New Jerusalem time, Father's name was on their foreheads. Uh, let's, I'm going to skip down to, I will write on him the name of my God. The Father's name was on their foreheads again. Uh, the New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. How about that? 312 and New Jerusalem comes down from heaven in uh, not only 22 but also 10 21 yeah 10 through 27 excuse me what okay and then the saints are granted to sit with Christ on his heavenly on the throne and the saints are granted to reign forever and ever so there's that parallelism going on between that it's part of the chiastic structure of revelation going on between the seven churches and the new Jerusalem, which I just, just give you a hint at, and I encourage you to go back and, and, and read these and find more parallelisms for yourself. And so this, yeah, it's a, a very interesting stuff to know. And I think uh, hopefully that was, that was good for you to just close out. I just wanted to read or actually I'm hoping each one of you will read one of these promises. So, uh, Sally, okay. we read the promise to Ephesus to us. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Great. Tammy, get prepared. You're on mute, I can see. But Barbara, could you read Smyrna? He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tammy, could you read Pergamus? To, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. I love this one because that manna mm -hmm. is God sustaining us, and the white stone is we are forgiven, we are exonerated by that white stone because of the, what God has done for us. 
Uh, Shirley, <laughs> do I have you to do this, yet? Tyra, Tyra? Okay, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. Let's hear. <laughs> yeah. Good Look man. at that power here. Mm -hmm. um, the power to a rod rule. of iron. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And uh, let's see now, who haven't we had yet? Uh, do I have? Has Gary? Has Gary gone? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, Sardis. It looks like. Uh, looks like we need to go a Larry or something. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. All right. Wow. <laughs> oh, he who has to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's others. <laughs> wow. I will confess his name. Philadelphia, uh, Eddie? And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give him power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. As I also have received from my father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then Laodicea, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in him to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus is our example. Jesus did it. He said, I did it. And you can be assured that you will do it too, you, you overcomers. Uh, I wanted to end with the, these promises because it's, it's really the part of uh, the personal part. Uh, when we read this, the seven churches, that personal part is so important to us, each one, what the meaning is, what the promise that God has for us. But there's also the prophetic part, and both those have the conditions, the warnings, solutions, and promises, by the way. And then that last part we did, understanding what that has to do with the New Jerusalem. As we get there, I'm sure that, that we'll, we'll see the mixture even more. So there's, there's more to come from the meaning of the seven churches. And that, uh, that's sort of a close of, of this. Any final questions before we close and have prayer? I thought it was excellent, Charlie. It was good. Thank you. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you got some, some good things out of it. Uh, I like the I like the chaotic model that helped a lot. Oh yeah, that, that, yeah. yeah. Well, as, you, as you read scripture more and more, you'll see how often it comes into play, and uh, it's a it's a it's a form of parallelism. In fact, it is a parallelism, but it it has that little peak sometimes and tells you where the where the main point is, and it's not where you think it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the some of the things that go with the way the Hebrew thought processes go. So, uh, Larry, could you have a closing prayer for us? Sure, I'd be glad to. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time that we had together to study the book of Revelation. We're grateful for Charlie and the time that he spent putting this together. And what a what a wonderful message that there was here for us this evening. Father, the, the promises that you've given us here for us to hold on to as we live our lives for you, Lord. We pray, Father, that this would soak into our hearts, that we can live the lives that you expect us to live, Father, and that we can share the gospel with others as you've commissioned us to do. Be with us now, Father, and all these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, I think next week we're doing Revelation chapter four. Okay. I think Eddie's Eddie has that on his plate. Yeah. 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 So we're looking forward to that, Eddie. Well, I hope I can do as half as good as you and Larry have done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Eddie.
Well, I, I think I think I'm going, to, I'm going to assure myself that's going to be the case. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.